Okay, so I'm gonna repeat just what I'd said before, just so that you guys can, um, so, it, so it's also in the video. So we're just doing a little factoring refresh. The whole idea is to get back into factoring trinomials, right? Three part polynomials, three term polynomials. Um, but what we're talking about today is just gonna be the, the very basics, the very beginning of uh, factoring. Um, and what we're trying to find, what we want to do first is always find the greatest common factor. We're always going to look for a greatest common factor first that we can pull out of each piece. Um, and the greatest common factor we call the GCF because it takes a long time to put out greatest common factor. So I'll see how long it took me to write that. My size keeps changing. My hand keeps touching the screen. And it's hard to be left-handed sometimes. So say I have two numbers. I have, let's go with 15 and, yeah, let's change it. Let's go 30 and 45. Let's go with 30 and 45. I can look at all of the factors of 30 and 45. I've got what? One times 30. I have two times 15. I have three times 10. And I have five times six, right? So every one of these numbers is a factor of 30. And there aren't any other factors of 30. Now, if I look at this one, I've got one times 45. Two doesn't go in. Does three go in? Yeah, three times 15. Uh, four doesn't go in. Five does, though. Five times nine. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine. So we're back at it. So these are all of my factors of 45, and these are all of my factors of 30. And the greatest common factor will be the biggest number that they share in factors. So yes, they are both reducible by one, right? They're both they both have a factor of one. They both have a factor of three. They both have a factor of five. They don't six, they don't 10, but 15, they both share as a factor, right? So I have a 15 here and I have a 15 here. So the GCF, the greatest common factor of these numbers would be 15. So if I wanted to reduce these numbers, say they were a fraction, say I had 30 over 15 uh, over 45 and I wanted to reduce this fraction, I would just divide them by their greatest common factor, right? So if I divided 30 by 15, I would get 2. And if I divided 45 by 15, I would get three. So we use greatest common factors all the time for reducing fractions, but we don't always know that's what we're doing. Um, so that is our beginning uh, outlook on, on this. I'm trying to find, I had a little sheet with all, oh, there it is, with little sample problems and I couldn't find it. So say I have a problem that's not just numbers. What if I have something like 12K minus 18? I want to pull, I want to reduce this to its simplest form. And I need to see if there is a common factor that they share that I can pull out. And I want to pull out the largest one. Because I can go, okay, I know that 12 is divisible by 2 and 18 is divisible by 2. And if I used that just because I knew it was 2, I would wind up with 12 divided by 2 is 6K minus 18 divided by 2, which is 9. But then that is still reducible, right? Because I didn't pull out the greatest common factor. These each still have a 3 in common, and I could pull that out. So I want to look at what is the greatest common factor between them, right? So, and you won't necessarily have to look at every factor, but I'm going to show you every factor, right? Two times six, three times four. I think that pretty much covers it. 18, I've got one times 18, two times nine, three times six, and I'm pretty sure that covers it. 
And so I'm going to look at these sets of numbers, right? And I'm going to go, okay, well, the highest one that they share is six. And so I can reduce this by six, right? I can factor from each piece, right? I'm looking at each term, right? This is one term and this is another term. And each term can have six factored out of it. And that would look like 12 divided by six is two. K doesn't get touched because we didn't do anything to it. 18 divided by six is three. And now we've reduced it. We've factored it to its simplest form. Um, it's not always going to work just with numbers. Sometimes we're going to have to factor variables too. So say I have um, 40x to the eighth power times y plus 64x to the x to the fourth y. We still need to look at what we can pull out of each of these terms, right? Now, 40 and 64, we can just break it down to its factors. Does anyone know the greatest common factor between 40 and 64? Well, if I take out two, I'm left with 20 and 32, and those are still divisible by two, right? If I divide 40 by two, I have 20. If I divide 64 by two, I, what's that? No, it's going to get even higher than that. Let's look at the factors of them, right? Here I have 40. So my factors of that are 1 and 40, 2 and 20, 3 doesn't go in, 4 and 10, 5 and 8, 6, 7, 8. So we're good there. 64, we've got 1 and 64. We've got 2 and 32. 3 doesn't work. 4, does 4 go in? Yes. 4 goes in 1, 16 times. 5 doesn't work. 6, no. 7, no. 8 times 8 is 64. And I believe that is all of our factors. I think 12 might go into 9, 10, 11, 12. But I don't need to look any further than this at this point, right? Because I see that 8 and 8 work, right? They each have an 8. So I know I can factor out an 8. But on this one, I have x to the 8th. And I this one, I have x to the fourth. When we're reducing our variables, we can always take out the lower one of both. So if I have x to the eighth here and x to the fourth here, what they do share in common is that they each have at least four x's, right? Because technically, x to the eighth, right, is x times 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 x, right? This is x to the eighth, right? x to the fourth is just x times x times x times x. And so what they have in common are four x's here and four x's here, right? So I can pull out x to the fourth on each piece, right? Because they both have at least x to the fourth. Now they each have one y, so that is a common factor between them. And so I could pull out a y. And what we're left with when we pull this out is, well, what's 40 divided by eight? It's five, right? X, we pulled four out, but we still have four left, right? If I take four away, I still have these four right here for X to the eighth. Our Y, we pulled it out. There's no Y left. Plus 64, well, 64 divided by eight is just eight. X to the fourth divided by X to the fourth. We had four X's. We pulled them all out. We don't have an X value now. Same thing with Y. We had one Y. We pulled out one Y. So we don't have a Y value anymore. Think of it in terms of Y divided by Y 
equals one. So really eight times one is still just eight. And so this is our factored solution here, right? So we're just looking at what things do they have in common that we can pull out. Um, I'll do one more so that you can kind of see how it goes. Let's do this one because it pulls everything out of the end. So what if I have 14m to the sixth minus 35m to the third minus 7m squared? The first thing I'm going to look at is the numbers. I can see a common factor in all of these numbers just by looking at it. Does anybody else see it right off the bat that all three of these numbers are divisible by? Not counting one. Yeah, seven, right? 14 times two is seven, 35. Five times seven is 35. And then one times seven is, is seven. And clearly it's not going to go any bigger than that because we can't multiply seven times something bigger than it and still get seven. So the first factor we know we'll be able to pull out is seven, right? So now each of them also have an M value in common. The first one has six M's, this one has three M's, and this one has two M's. So the only thing they all have in common is that they each have at least two M's, right? They have M squared. So I can pull out M squared. Does that make some sense? This one has two, this one has three, this one has six but they all have at least two. So I'm gonna factor that out and I'm gonna to go to my numbers. Well, 14 divided by seven is two. I had six M's, I took out two, so I'm left with M to the fourth. Minus 35 divided by seven is just five. I had three M's here, I took out two, so I'm left with one. Now I have 7m squared, but I divided by 7m squared. So what am I left with there? I factored 7m squared out of 7m squared. So what do I get left with? Well, I already have that there, but does anything happen to the 7m squared? Think about this. When we're factoring, we're dividing, right? So if I have 7m squared and I divide it by 7m squared, what does that equal? What is any number divided by itself? What's 3 divided by 3? Yeah, same thing works here when we've got variables. Anything divided by itself, still going to be one, right? And we can't leave that as a blank. We actually have to put the one in as a placeholder. Because when you think about it, what I did here is I undistributed. And if I wanted to, I could multiply this back in to each piece, and I should get the same thing we started with right? But if I don't have that one there, then it just chops off right here, right? We would never have that 7m squared at the end. So keep that in mind. These are all division problems. What did we do with this? The first piece we took 14m to the sixth and we divided it by 7m squared. And this became two. And this, right? We took two of the six away and we wound up with m to the fourth right that second piece we had minus 35 m to the third and we divided it by 7 m squared right 35 divided by 7 is just negative 5 
And then we had three M's and we took two. So we're still left with one M. And then the last part, we just did this. And that's how we get those pieces. We're dividing them out individually. Does that make some sense to you guys? Pay particular attention to this example because I think it might have been the example I used in my Ed Puzzle question. So just in case, um, I might have actually solved that one for you. The only other thing I'm going to show you right now is the little chart because I go into the divide division of trinomials and we're really only talking about factoring trinomials. Factoring trinomials when A equals one. So we're in the very basics of factoring trinomials. Um, so what we're saying is if we have an AX squared plus BX, oops, sorry, BX plus C and A is equal to one, which means that we don't have any number in front of that X squared because it's one. Um, there is a little chart that I created that you can follow. I mean, I didn't really create it, but it helps me to find the solutions or at least know what they're going to look like. So when I have AX squared plus BX plus C, I know that my factors are going to be X plus something times X plus something. And the reason I know that is everything here is positive. I can't have a negative when everything in the equation is positive. Um, the next thing that I have is when I have AX squared minus BX plus C. My factors will be X minus something, X minus something else. Right? I know what those factors are going to look like. If I have AX squared plus BX minus C, I'm going to have X plus something, X minus something. Notice that my variables are not the same, right? I have a positive and a negative because at the end, when we distribute this, these two numbers would multiply together, right? Whatever goes here and whatever goes here. And for that to create a negative, one has to be positive and one has to be negative because two negatives would make it positive. Um, when B is positive, right? Our bigger factor, just put in the big there, will be positive and our smaller factor will be negative. AX squared minus BX minus C, same thing, right? We're going to have an X plus something times an X minus something, but we're going to switch spots because when this is negative, our bigger factor is negative and our smaller factor is positive. Um, and I'll just give you a quick example of what that looks like with one of these. I'm just going to do the first one. I'm going to do x squared plus 6x plus 5. And if I want to find the factors of that, um, the first step is you're going to take your factors, take factors. I go over this in the Ed Puzzle, so I don't want to of our C value that add to our B value. So what we're saying is we're going to take the factors of our C, right? This is our C is five, right? The end term. Our first is A, right? This one in front of it. Six is our B. And so we want to take the factors of C that add up to B. And in this case, it's really easy because five only has one times five, and they do, if you add them together, add up to six. 
what do I know about this? Everything is positive here. So I know my factors are going to be X plus something times X plus something else. And those two things are going to be the factors that we pull that add up to six. So one will go in here and five will go in there. Um, I'm not going to keep going with that simply because I really do get into it in pretty much in pretty good detail um, in the Ed Puzzle. Um, I am going to have you guys find the greatest common factor of a number before I uh, let you go. You can put it into the chat box. So I want you to find the greatest common factor, not O, greatest common factor of, let's go with 30 and 75. And you can just put that into the chat box when you get it. Um, and it will be participation for the class. Does anyone have any questions regarding any of this? You're pretty good. Yeah, this is all review. So you should be okay. And then you've still got the Ed puzzle to go. I have to figure out what the greatest common factor of these two numbers is. I haven't done it yet. Thirty doesn't go into seventy-five, right? If it was going to be thirty, thirty would have to divide evenly into seventy-five. Might be. Uh, sure. It doesn't count against you to to give it a shot. I haven't checked it out yet, but I think you might be right. Because really, there's. Uh, I think actually, I think actually five is wrong now. Not not that you'll uh, be fired from school or anything. 